started. So I just want to say a few uh, words to, to get us started. So my name is Mona and I'm a volunteer with the Sauerland Conservancy. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk by David Wilco from Princeton University. Um, so just a few sort of words of housekeeping. So I think everyone is pretty much muted and uh, that's how we'd like to keep it during the talk so that there are fewer distractions. We can help with that. Uh, feel free to keep your camera off, but it's nice to see faces. So if you're willing to put your camera on, that's uh, even better, but up to you. Um, basically the structure of this event is that um, we'll let Professor Wilco uh, present. Uh, he has some slides uh, for about 40 to 45 minutes. And then we'll have time for questions um, and an answer period. Um, so um, just a few words about our guest speaker. So Professor Wilco is a professor of, and there you're a professor of multiple things. So I have to look at my <laughs> look at my notes uh, of ecology, evolutionary biology, and public affairs at Princeton. He's uh, undergraduate degrees from Yale, and his PhD is from Princeton. Um, the primary question that drives his research is how to find room for biodiversity in a world that is increasingly hot, hungry, and crowded. Um, and so his work focuses on the impacts of farming, logging, hunting, climate change, and other human actions on biodiversity. Um, and he and his research team of graduate students and postdocs have studied those issues um, around the world. Um, and he's the author of two books, No Way Home, The Decline of the World's uh, Greatest Animal Migrations, and The Condor Shadow. Um, I know that Professor Wilco is a member of multiple boards of directors, uh, um, different types of organizations, and also have received numerous prizes. And I also know that he is a very beloved uh, teacher at Princeton. So I'm very excited that we get to be his students uh, for the next hour or so. So with that, I'll give the word to you. Thank you very much, Mona. I appreciate the introduction. And please let me know if uh, there's any trouble seeing uh, my slides or hearing me. And I always welcome the chance to talk about animal migrations, uh, particularly in the spring. I've been an avid bird watcher since I was a little kid. And like most bird watchers, it is the spring and the fall when the birds are migrating that. Uh, I am most excited to be outdoors and most uh, appreciative of that phenomenon. And indeed for all of us, uh, this is the time of year when you can really see not just birds, but all sorts of animals on the move. And migration really has awed people probably for as long as there've been people, uh, but particularly as we've learned more about the animals, some of these migratory feats seem uh, even more astounding than we might have imagined. So uh, in 2007, a bar-tailed godwit uh, generated headlines when it flew nonstop from its breeding grounds in Northern Alaska to its wintering grounds in New Zealand, a journey of over 7,000 miles, 11,700 kilometers. And I think uh, many of you may uh, remember uh, from the fall of 2019 when there were a lot of newspaper stories about a uh, study in the journal Science that reported uh, about a 30% decline in populations of North American birds since 1970. And uh, a sort of back of the envelope calculation that that amounted to the loss of about three billion birds. What I think is so interesting and important about um, this study is that it dealt with something beyond just whether these species were going to go extinct or not, because for, for the most part, they're not. We will still have 
Baltimore Orioles is shown here, but it dealt with the fact that even the common birds are becoming notably less common. And that's a theme that I want to uh, develop a bit this evening talking with you, because as I like to say, migration is a phenomenon of numbers. It's not the single monarch or the single tanager, or the single swallow, the single pronghorn. Um, it's the fact that you can have clouds of monarchs and large numbers of migratory birds, great schools of salmon or herds of uh, grazing mammals moving through a landscape that is both inspiring and um, important to people, but also very important ecologically. And as the migrants become less and less common, we stand to lose an awful lot. And I'll be talking a bit about that. I would say that we can classify the threats to animal migrations for primary uh, areas. Uh, there's habitat destruction, the uh, human created obstacles that impair migration, our over exploitation of migratory species and uh, looming, uh, really not looming in the horizon so much as with us now and likely to get worse, uh, climate change. And I'll touch bases on uh, many of these. But again, it's the thing about migratory animals, it's not just that there are a lot of threats where there, which is true, it's the fact that the animals move across all sorts of borders. Borders that are very meaningful to us in terms of how we uh, sort out our human affairs, but truly meaningless to the animals. And that uh, complicates conservation quite a bit. And again, returning to a theme, our goal isn't just to prevent the extinction of these species, but rather I think we want to keep the common species common. And in fact, that is something that the Sauerland Conservancy is actively doing and for which I think we can all be grateful. So I'll just talk about a couple of iconic migrations to kind of build on this point. And I wanna begin with the Eastern population of monarch butterflies. And so uh, sometime around February on a mountaintop in Michoacan, Mexico, virtually the entire Eastern North American population of monarchs started getting restless and started moving north. And they probably just recently hit the Southeastern United States, first few individuals, and they will lay their eggs and those eggs will develop into caterpillars and butterflies. Those butterflies will continue farther north, do the same thing, lay eggs, die. Those eggs will develop into butterflies that will continue the journey forward. And so in about four to five generations, the monarchs will have basically recolonized North America. And then that last generation that's born in the late summer, instead of continuing this northern migration, they move in the other direction and they return to that location in Mexico that was last seen by their great or great great grandparents. And they will spend the winter there before once again, a year from now, resuming their journey. And it's really quite an extraordinary journey at that. So just to remind you, it's a multi-generational journey to repopulate, say, New Jersey, really all of Eastern North America, and then a single generation that goes back to the wintering grounds. And this is a more distant view of the wintering grounds in the mountains. They don't winter in the lowlands, which is where you might expect a cold-blooded insect to be, but instead they move into the higher elevation uh, conifer forests. And this brown color here isn't uh, dead needles on the conifers, it's actually uh, butterflies, countless monarch butterflies. 
But as um, we've seen and you've heard a lot that monarchs are doing quite poorly. Uh, and part of the reason has been the deforestation in the areas in Mexico where they winter. And these lines, these uh, black lines denote reserves that were set up for the monarchs. Um, and we're looking from the early 1970s to 1999. And you can just see as the loss of the green inside these marks the uh, clearing of forests inside those reserves. And it gets so cold where the monarchs winter that snow can fall. In fact, I've, I've seen that phenomenon. And the butterflies depend on dense forests to provide kind of a thermal blanket. And so the logging is opening holes in that blanket and the butterflies are freezing. And if you take a look, uh, you can see uh, as of uh, about uh, 20 years ago, this was the loss of forest in the overall region. And then within that region, the loss of forest and the butterfly reserves over time. And these were projections as to what would happen if the forest loss continued. And in fact, um, it did continue. And there have been episodic efforts by the Mexican government to stop the deforestation and seems to go in fits and starts. So that uh, was the story of the decline of the Eastern monarchs as we knew it. But uh, increasingly we realize that there are other factors at play as well. So one issue that has gained a lot of attention uh, has to do with the loss of milkweed here in the United States because the monarch is, uh, it, it's caterpillars feed only on milkweed. So it's uh, milkweed is the obligate host plant for the monarchs. And there was a story that, an article that came out uh, receives the National Academy of Sciences uh, quite recently that looked at long-term trends using herbarium specimens in the number of milkweed and again, using museum specimens, uh, look for trends in the number of monarchs. And the thing to know here is that in fact, they found evidence of a steady decline in milkweed dating back to the 1950s. Um, and this was long before we even knew where the monarch butterflies wintered and well before there was extensive logging. So these butterflies are facing threats uh, both in their breeding grounds and in their wintering grounds. And that is typical for all manner of migratory species and something that makes their conservation challenging. So to, to bring into focus another example, one that I hope is particularly uh, relevant to uh, those of you uh, uh, who uh, support the Sauerland Conservancy, we know that populations of forest-dwelling songbirds are disappearing from parks and protected areas throughout the Eastern United States. This is part of that story of the 30% uh, decline in our bird populations since 1970. I spent a number of years living in the Washington DC area where we were fortunate to have some parks that the local bird watchers monitor the, the, the breeding bird count every year. Now these are old data going from the uh, immediate post-war years to uh, the late 70s. But you see these rather striking declines in these different parks in the populations of warblers and vireos uh, to what were initially very common, colorful groups of birds nesting in these parks. And their numbers went down and continued to go down. Uh, so this was first really brought to the attention of people uh, by bird watchers in the Washington DC area, but then in other woodlands and preserves in the East where people had been monitoring birds for a long time. And frankly, there aren't that many places where they do. 
a similar phenomenon was noted. And so we have these populations of birds declining, the migratory species declining quite significantly, but the resident species, things like the chickadees and the tip mice, they didn't seem to be declining. So of course, one would immediately suspect that this is due to the loss of tropical forests uh, because the long distance or neotropical migrants were disappearing while the re resident birds weren't. This seemed like a logical conclusion. And indeed, uh, that may well be uh, an important factor. But beginning in the late 70s and through the 80s, we began to realize that that was far from the only factor that could be driving these declines. Um, we had to think about other things like the loss and fragmentation of their breeding habitat, and even the loss of the stopover habitat, the places they use uh, to rest and refuel during their migrations. And this is significant uh, because one of the things that we have learned is that a lot of the long distance migratory songbirds uh, are very vulnerable to a set of changes that occur, particularly in the wake of uh, what I would call uh, suburban sprawl, uh, that when uh, extensive forest tracts are uh, broken apart by suburban development, a set of changes kicks in. Well, people keep cats and a lot of people don't keep their cats indoors. So you have more predators out, put up bird feeders and you draw in species like blue jays. It's a beautiful bird. I'm a big fan of blue jays, but they also are nest predators and their population densities increase in uh, residential neighborhoods with the bounty of food that's provided. And then they in turn, um, move into the forests where the nests of these songbirds uh, are readily available to be preyed upon. And of course, as I suspect many of you know all too well, these sorts of environments, you get a lot of raccoons, possums, um, things that we sometimes refer to as meso predators are not the top predators in the system. They're not uh, you know, mountain lions or wolves, uh, they're omnivores and they are inveterate nest predators as well. So it becomes a very hostile environment, the songbirds. And just to show you some old data where you look at the percentage of, this was done using artificial nests, not real bird nests, uh, as a function of the size of the forest. And this is on an exponential scale. So you go from forests that are only about 25 acres or left up to forests the size of our national parks. And you do see this pattern that the smaller forests, the more fragmented forests, higher rates of nest predation. A second species that drew a lot of attention in the 80s and 90s as a, a possible driver of the declines that were being seen uh, in fragmented forests, particularly in agricultural landscapes, is the brown-headed cowbird, which as those of you who are bird watchers know, it's a brood parasite. Cowbirds don't build their own nests or raise their own young. Instead, they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. A cowbird egg hatches ahead of its uh, host's own eggs. The young cowbird grows faster than the host's offspring and usually crowds out or outcompetes the host's offspring. So a warbler or vireo ends up raising cowbird chicks instead of its own. And indeed, cowbirds were originally most common in the Great Plains where they followed the herds of bison and ate the insects that the bison stirred up as they moved the grasslands. But with the introduction of livestock and agriculture, they expanded into the east. And in forest fragments in rural areas that have uh, a lot of livestock, 
the populations of cowbirds can be quite high and the rate of parasitism of the nests of the songbirds that try to eke out a living in the forest fragments is very high, meaning the songbirds get out very few offspring, probably not nearly enough to sustain their populations. There was a very nice study on this that uh, came out, uh, oh, now, uh, you know, uh, over almost 20 years ago, uh, but it looked at the percentage of nests of various species that were parasitized as a function of how much of that landscape was in forest. So of course, the lower the percentage, the more fragmented the landscape is by farmland. And for species like the red-eyed vireo, the wood thrush, uh, worm-eating warbler, oven bird, all of which would be familiar to uh, those who uh, spend time watching birds in the Sauerland area, uh, there was quite a significant relationship. As the, we're gonna move backwards, as the land becomes increasingly fragmented, the rate of parasitism by cowbirds escalates. And you think about this, and I haven't talked about the stopover points because that's even less well known. In fact, we have a project underway now to learn more about the stopover needs of our songbirds breeding in North America. But if you think about it from a conservation challenge, let's take a, a bird like the Swainson's thrush. Um, a Swainson's thrush that say is uh, nesting in Saskatchewan, just over the US border. Uh, and it will winter in the Western Amazon. I did a, a very, very sketchy guess, assuming it could fly a couple hundred miles a night and try to imagine its route and where it would need to rest. And figure that this thrush making its migration uh, northward would likely go through 10 different countries, 40 states, province, departments, the sort of major subnational categories. And it would certainly fly over if it didn't stop in hundreds of counties and towns. And in a certain sense, for that thrush to continue making that journey and for its, uh, uh, and for future generations of thrushes to continue to do that, in one way or another, all of these entities have to do the right thing by the thrush to ensure that the bird has the habitat it needs. And in an increasingly fractious, disputatious world, that's difficult to accomplish. That's really tough. Um, and just to, just to give you a sense of some of these challenges, I want to take you to a very different part of the world and just highlight a, a recent finding uh, made by actually one of my graduate students, a uh, very talented ornithologist named Tong Mu. And Tong has been interested in the two dozen or so shorebirds species that nest up in uh, the Russian far north and move along the coast of Asia, wintering in southern China, Southeast Asia, down to Australia, New Zealand, sort of the areas in blue. And in particular, he was focusing on the uh, redneck stint, also sometimes called the rufous neck sandpiper, which has a uh, breeding range just a little bit in westernmost Alaska, but mostly up here in uh, Siberia. And Tong went up to Siberia and attached uh, some geolocators to the legs of redneck stints on their breeding grounds. And these geolocators, I have a picture of them, are tiny little devices that record uh, light levels and, you, and with that data, you can recreate the route that the bird took, but you gotta catch the bird again. So Tong was betting that these little geolocators, you attach them usually at the base of the foot of a shorebird and then 
put a band and a flag. This is, by the way, not a redneck stint. I don't want my bird watching audience to correct me. I know it's a ruddy turnstone, but I don't have a picture of a redneck stint wearing one of these. But you, if you can catch the bird again and remove the geolocator, uh, you can find out where it went. Um, and we, we expended a lot of money on geolocators uh, and got only three back. Uh, so that meant Tong would put them on one summer and hope that the birds survive and then return to the same general area up in the uh, tundra. And then he had to find them and then he had to catch them. And of course, in that uh, situation, if the birds even moved a couple of miles from where you caught it previous summer, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to find it. But we did get data from three. And what was so interesting to me is if you traced where three sandpipers basically nesting next to each other, I mean, they were very close to each other within a couple of kilometers. Where did those three sandpipers winter? Well, one wintered in Thailand, another wintered in Sulawesi, and the third decided to uh, head to Australia. And so if we look at this, if you just wanted to conserve the little population of redneck stints nesting up here in uh, the uh, Russian tundra, you would actually have to worry about activities across probably about 1,500 miles, almost the entire winter range of that species. And, and so this, this is the issue of migratory connectivity, whether the birds in a given area that breed closely together, whether they all winter together or they split up on the wintering grounds. And in this case, it's a very extreme example of them splitting up. Um, it just gives you a sense of the challenges involved in protecting some of these species. I did want to mention obstacles too. Uh, they are particularly important uh, in the case of mammal migrations where a single poorly designed fence can choke off, say, a pronghorn migration that's gone on for hundreds or even thousands of years. You see here some pronghorn trying to squeeze under a fence. Uh, but it's also significant in other media as well. In the sea, uh, there's a real problem with uh, cetaceans getting entangled in fishing gear. And that, in fact, is the primary threat to one of the most endangered mammals in the world, the North Atlantic right whale, which does migrate off the coast of New Jersey. But also, uh, there's growing concern for the impact that tall buildings, as well as some uh, wind uh, uh, renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, facilities have for migratory birds and for bats. Again, something we should take into consideration because of course we want to be advocates for renewable energy. It's critically important. We have to think carefully about where we cite those sorts of things. The threat of overexploitation is another one that uh, my uh, research group has been looking at. And I, I like to begin with uh, this uh, picture because these are old decoys from the United States uh, from an era of rampant hunting of wildlife the last quarter of the 19th century, well into the first quarter of the 20th, a time when you could go into a market and buy uh, basically a bushel of robins or of sandpipers or of waterfowl. Uh, and it led to uh, tremendous declines in all manner of migratory species, particularly the birds that aggregated in large numbers where they could be easily shot or netted. Uh, and we brought that under control by and large in this country with a set of laws beginning uh, with the Lacey Act and then the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. 
in the teens and 20s. Uh, but it's a big issue elsewhere in the world. One of the things we're looking at now is the uh, trapping by net or snares of migratory shorebirds in uh, China. Uh, this is a, a sad picture of a spoon-billed sandpiper that was caught in a mist net put up by hunters along the China coast. Uh, for those of you who are bird watchers, you may know that the spoon-billed sandpiper is one of the world's rarest birds. And uh, we see evidence of widespread hunting, uh, unregulated hunting in much of the world. Uh, and not just the developing world, uh, in Europe, there are countries along the Mediterranean that engage every year in uh, what can only be described as a slaughter of migratory birds crossing the Mediterranean Sea. The threat of climate change, I think, is one that we will have to take very seriously with respect to migrating animals. You know, there are some clear uh, cases, or I should say, situations that we can clearly predict are going to be problematic. So the loss of coastal habitats due to rising sea levels is going to pose a great threat to beach nesting birds like the piping plover uh, and sea turtles, for that matter particularly in an age where people have built close to the shore. So it's not as though the beaches can just move inland with uh, rising sea levels. Similarly, uh, as uh, climate change affects uh, species, changing temperature and precipitation, we might worry about high altitude species like white-tailed ptarmigan, uh, but it gets, even more complicated than that, because the indirect effects of climate change may be equal to or greater than the direct impacts. And really, you know, we, we, this has been described by folks as phenological disruptions, uh, but really what we're talking about is messing around with the timing of things. And so the example I want to give you uh, to start is this uh, little bird, this is a pied flycatcher. And uh, observers have noted a tremendous decline of it in parts of Europe, including a 90% decline in parts of the Netherlands. Now, the pied flycatcher breeds in Europe and uh, Western Asia. And then it winters in Sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, there, there's something uh, very interesting that seems to be going on here. It's illustrated well. In the, yeah, it's illustrated well on the next slide. So the normal turn of events in uh, Europe, well as Eastern North America, is that a rising temperature triggers the leaf out of our trees. And in particular, when the leaves just coming out and they're young and the plant, the tree has not pumped a lot of um, secondary compounds into the leaves to make them uh, defended against insects. That's when there's a host of caterpillars that chow down on those leaves. This is something you can see. Uh, you can at least hear, if not see, if you go into the forests here in uh, early mid-May, uh, and look in the oak trees in particular, you'll see, you'll hear the, the frass from the caterpillars raining down. Um, but it's this superabundance of caterpillars that provides a uh, rich food source that a lot of the songbirds use to raise their young. And what seems to be happening in the case of the pied flycatcher is climate change is causing an earlier leaf out of the trees. That means the caterpillars are emerging earlier. But remember, the pied flycatchers are down in sub-Saharan Africa for the winter. So they are, they're not attuned to this difference. They're using uh, a clue like change in day length to tell them when it's time to go north. So they are returning to Europe and they're missing the peak of the caterpillar boom 
for raising their offspring. And that seems to have been a key factor driving this decline. So with the pied flycatchers, which has been this tremendous decline, well, we can ask, and I'm going, dealing with those forest dwelling migratory songbirds, is the same thing happening here in the United States and Canada? And there is a growing body of evidence that this is an issue, that uh, the uh, peak of the insects is not timed as nicely to the arrival of the birds as it used to be. And that could uh, have quite serious consequences for birds that are unable to adjust the timing of their migration. Now, I think they can to some degree, but uh, I don't know that all of them can. And I don't know how quickly they can do that. So it's another thing to be concerned about. And of course, it's not just climate change. You have to ask, well, how would habitat fragmentation be compounding uh, the problems that the birds face, particularly the birds that depend on forests? So again, loss of winter habitat, fragmentation of breeding habitat, climate change. You begin to see this sort of buildup of problems, and it becomes easier to understand why we might lose 30% of our birds uh, since 1970. So I, I wanna circle back to that point I made earlier that migration is a phenomenon of abundance. It's not one swallow may make a summer, but one swallow sure doesn't make a great migratory spectacle. And the abundance of these migrants is really what makes them so important ecologically. So just to uh, try to riff off this a little bit, take uh, our forest dwelling migratory songbirds. A colleague and I a number of years ago did some back of the envelope calculations and concluded that these songbirds consume somewhere between six to 21 million pounds of defoliating insects per day. And that was with population numbers of about 20 years ago. So uh, you can see, and, and back then it was probably, if you remember some of my early slides from Washington DC, 20 years ago, we probably had uh, many fewer songbirds than we had 40 years ago. And today we have many fewer than we have uh, 20, had 20 years ago. So this, this uh, population of migratory songbirds is declining. And you have to wonder what it means for the health of our forests. Uh, but to give you a, a slightly more concrete example, along the Columbia River and its uh, main uh, tributaries in Washington, Oregon, California, and Idaho in the 1800s, roughly 350 to 500 million pounds of salmon swam upstream to spawn. It was the greatest salmon run in the world. Uh, and today, that has been reduced by over 90% uh, as a function of logging that has degraded the rivers, uh, over harvest, uh, agriculture, and in particular, uh, hydropower, the construction of the great dams that block a lot of these migrations. So, what does it mean when you lose 90% or more of this, this uh, mass of salmon? Well, there are a few ways to think of it. Um, it has some pretty profound ecosystem changes. It's a loss of food for species that depend on the fish or feed heavily on them, like bald eagles, bears. Interestingly enough, it's a loss of nutrients. Because one rather unglamorous way to look at a salmon is to say that as a small fish born in a stream, it moves out into the ocean. And it's in the ocean where it grows to its adult size, taking advantage of all of the rich food resources in the ocean. Then in one or two years, depending on the species, it comes back upstream, spawns, dies, and decomposes. So it's really kind of a 
marine bag of fertilizer that worked its way up to the rivers. And in fact, there was one study that calculated how much nitrogen and phosphorus from the ocean is no longer going into the Colorado, I'm sorry, into the Columbia River system uh, due to the migration of salmon. And they concluded it was about 11 to 15 million pounds. Now, we're probably make, more than making that up in some places with all of the agricultural runoff, but that's certainly not the, shall we say, organic fertilizer that the salmon provided. And then yet another study claimed to be able to show traces of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from salmon, decayed salmon, in the leaves of and fruit of grapes grown in California. So uh, I've never seen this, but I have to believe that if you were a really talented sommelier, in addition to describing a red wine as oaky or the berry-like taste, you would point out that it also tastes fishy. But I'm not aware of any sommelier so talented. Let me, let me close not by uh, going on at length about the, the, the risk to migration. I'll talk about what we might be able to do to save animal migrations. And I, I unfortunately don't have any simple answer uh, because it's not a simple problem. But I think we do make progress when we think and act both globally and locally. So at the international level, there are various international agreements and initiatives, bilateral agreements and initiatives designed to safeguard migratory species. Maybe not as the intention, but as a consequence. So we're gonna to have to work internationally to combat climate change. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act has been a very important device for preventing the overexploitation of the birds that migrate between Canada, the United States and Mexico. We have the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And although the US is not a signatory, there is operating elsewhere the Convention on Migratory Species. And I just want to highlight the importance of these sorts of multilateral international agreements uh, because the animals themselves do not pay attention to the borders and boundaries that we find so important. At the national level, I think we want to continue to pay close attention to how the federal lands are managed. And, and I highlight this, the national forest, national grasslands in particular, uh, because especially in the West, but also in the East, most of the large contiguous forest blocks are in federal ownership. Um, and Certainly the work that's been done on the ecology of the songbirds on the breeding grounds suggests that large contiguous blocks of forest are really important for the birds. The national forests, as you know, are open to multiple uses, including logging, grazing, recreation. And I think it's important that those uses be done in ways that also ensure the conservation of the migratory forest dwelling birds within them. And if we get to the local or regional level, and here I'm, I'm thinking about um, Sarlin Conservancy, I think it's awfully important that we protect large intact blocks of habitat, including forest, maybe even especially forest, that we strive to maintain connectivity between protected forests, uh, maybe through ensuring riparian corridors or having stepping stones of forest, protected forest that uh, connect uh, larger tracts of forest. And more generally, there is a real benefit in the surrounding landscapes outside the forests to maintaining a diverse landscape in the matrix because with patches of forest, uh, shrubby areas, uh, little bits of greenery between uh, 
farm fields or urban or parks and urban areas were providing stopover sites for uh, the migratory species that fly. I do want to close though by, by saying that, that, that there is one issue that we have to deal with here in New Jersey and in many other Northeastern states that I don't have an easy answer to. Um, because much of my talk has focused on uh, the species like the worm-eating warbler, the black and white warbler that really do best in older intact forests. But there is also a contingent of songbirds like the golden wing warbler and the morning warbler that have declined precipitously, in many cases even more so than these species. And they kind of like young forests and openings in forests. So there, there is a tension here, the degree to which we want to uh, tolerate or even encourage uh, power line corridors uh, or openings in forests that benefit these species as well. And people occasionally ask me, well, what's the answer? I don't, I don't have a simple answer to that, other than to say that these are, there are valid conservation concerns on both sides of this uh, equation, so to speak. Um, and so it's not a question of either or, but it's figuring out where we can accommodate the early successional species in ways that are not going to be uh, overly harmful to the uh, forest, older forest dependent species. But this will be a challenge that we will all deal with as conservationists uh, in uh, places like New Jersey. To, to wrap up, I think the benefits of saving the great animal migrations are, are many. Um, if we actually do it, it means we've learned to cooperate with our neighbors in other states, our neighbors in other countries in particular. And I think that's important for addressing a whole range of problems. It'll get us into the mindset of proactive conservation. The more we think about keeping common species common, um, the more likely we are to be able to protect species before they become rare, because of course, the rarer they become, the less our chances of success are. It is in the abundance of the migratory animals that we get so many important ecosystem services, whether it's pollination, uh, controlling defoliating insects, food from the sea, uh, and we protect a truly magnificent set of natural phenomena that have, uh, I think, inspired everyone uh, who has the chance to witness it. And of course, if we're going to succeed, it means we've created a global network of protected areas that will benefit not just the migratory species, but all of the other species that happen to live in those areas. And that's terrific. And in fact, in the end, if we're successful in protecting the migratory species and keeping them as common as possible, I think that's something we can all kind of jump for joy about. And with that, I thank you. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was uh, incredibly informative and fascinating. Um, really I wonderful. Well, thank you.